Uh, I'm, whoops, wrong direction, there we go. Uh, I'm Chris Stepson. I'm the Chief Architect of Professional Services at NGINX, and I also lead the microservices practice. Uh, prior to being at, at NGINX, I was um, uh, a Vice President of Technology at a number of, of development agencies and built large websites, Lexus.com, uh, part of Restoration Hardware, Sirius Satellite Radio, Visa.com. So I've been building apps for a long time, and uh, uh, I'm very excited to be at Nginx, where they're, we're helping change and transform uh, applications in this new microservices world. I also have with me Ben Horwitz, who's my uh, one of my architects and also working in the microservices practice that we have. Ben, do you want to do a quick? I'm Ben. Uh, I'm a technical architect in the professional services department at Nginx. Um, most of my experience has been in the agency business before, so I'm bringing that to professional services so we can help tailor our Nginx and our microservices best practices to what our customers need. All right. So today we are going to talk about, um, about implementing a web microservice using Nginx Plus uh, and using microservices practices. Um, we're going to start by looking at the problem kind of holistically and seeing you know, what, what, what it means to have a web uh, microservice. Um, once we've understood what, what, what we're talking about, then we're going to talk about the things that you need in order to implement a web microservice effectively. The first being MVC, uh, the model view controller pattern, um, one that we found is, is very effective for implementing uh, the control patterns and, and uh, view systems that, that you utilize in a uh, web system on top of your microservices. We're also going to look at session state and how you manage session and, and uh, why you need information about the user in a session state. Finally, we're going to talk about routing in uh, the application, how you manage the, the various types of application components that need to access your microservices in the background. All right. Um, so when most people think about a microservices uh, application, they think about the service graph of microservices underneath the system. Um, and if they don't think about that, then they often think about the public API that, that you is the surface to that, that microservice application in the back end. Um, uh, you know, and it's, a, it, it's the thing that, that many people utilize to, to access with their iOS client or their Android system or their TiVo device or, you know, it, that API is, is often what people think of as the microservice. But most microservice applications also need a, a web front end of one sort or another. And you want that web front end to behave like all the rest of your microservices. You want them to live ephemerally. You want them to, to be able to spin up, spin down, um, and utilize all of the services in the back end without being a big monolithic application in and of itself. And then I, I expect him to, 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 you know, add his two cents in this, this whole process because he and I have worked together for, for a number of years now, and, and he has many opinions about. It. Yeah, I will jump in wherever I disagree. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, so one of the things that that you know you need to keep in mind when you're talking about about web applications is that they're very complex. Um, they incorporate all the client and display logic in the back end. They have, uh, you know, you often have complex JavaScript. You have to incorporate a lot of design and user experience stuff. Um, on the left is a, a context diagram of uh, an e-commerce application that, that I built a couple years ago. Um, and as you can see, there are many layers to the application, many components to it. And this was just the, the front end component that, that we built. On top of being complex, um, the web applications often have to cross service boundaries. So uh, as you can see here, this is the, the controller graph of that e-commerce application that I described. 
And you can see that it goes across many different parts of the application. Um, think of, of these controllers as, as essentially accessing individual microservices on the back end and understand that, that this web application needs to be able to access those fluidly so that, that the user is able to move seamlessly across all of the microservices in the background. Um, it also needs to be aware of, of information that you might put into one service and then access in another. So for example, when you're in the cart, if you are, are putting information into the uh, shipping uh, service, you want to be able to access that, that same information for the, the payment service. So you have, you have to have this, this understanding and awareness that crosses service boundaries in your, your system. Um, it also needs to be very fluid and very performant. Users hate it when, when uh, your application doesn't respond quickly and, and isn't able to transition from place to place. So you have a lot of requirements that are bound up in your, your web front end that you have to be able to manage and have to be able to effectively uh, instrument. Um, unfortunately, this, this requirement of being aware of all of these applications really goes against a lot of the, the principles and design direction of microservices. Um, in microservices, the idea is that your service needs to be simple, focused, and stateless. Um, so, where we want to go is that we think that using the, the principles that we lay out tonight, that you will be able to have harmonious synchronicity of your web application, your web microservice on top of your, your uh, application using MVC for control, attached resources to manage session state, um, and then Nginx Plus underneath for all of your routing needs. All right. So <clears throat> let's start by talking about, uh, about MVC. Um, as many of you are probably aware, the model view controller uh, pattern has been around for a while. Um, uh, it originally came out with, um, in, in LISP, I believe, uh, but, <laughs> but the, uh, the, the biggest proponent of, of the MVC pattern was the next computer operating system. It filtered into Interface Builder, um, and utilize it across the objective C uh, system that they built for the next operating system, which begat the, uh, the uh, Mac OS X. Also, it was transferred into the web objects uh, development framework. Anybody ever used web objects in the past? No. So that was, that was the first, uh, first web-based MVC system that was then copied by the Java guys into Struts, and that was where, where MVC really took off. Um, the thing about MVC that's, that's very powerful is it's very good at helping to separate concerns. Um, and it, it really it does a good job of, of implementing a control layer on top of your application. All right, <clears throat> so there are a number of components that uh, go into a, an MVC system. Um, obviously, you have, have your views, which uh, in a web environment are HTML, CSS, um, uh, and J JavaScript that's rendered from the, the backend pages, um, such as, as PHP pages and the like. Um, controllers manage the state and, uh, and the routing actions. Um, and then we have uh, a series of of, uh, of facades, essentially, that, that access the, the microservices, which are your models. Um, model view controller uh, pattern has actually blossomed quite a bit in the web world. Um, at this point, you can, you can get any number of, of uh, MVC systems for whatever language framework you like. Um, we use Symfony on uh, our reference architecture. Um, uh, I have used Spring. Uh, I built the, the e-commerce system using uh, AngularJS, so we put all of it into the, the JavaScript environment. Um, but this allows you to cleanly adapt to uh, your application to the microservice system. Um, 
And really the hardest part about building the whole thing is the, the control layer. As you can see in, in that the application back couple uh, of slides here, you know, this, this is what you end up having to do in your application. So that control is, is, is really important. All right. So, and the biggest reason that control is so difficult is because um, you have to have a high level of awareness of what your, your user is doing as they're, they're navigating your site. Um, this awareness is, has uh, traditionally been implemented by, by using state, uh, session state in the application. So most of the, the web frameworks have some ability to store data into session. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, and, and that can that can be. Ooh, whoa. Um, let me see if we can get get back where we were. Sorry about that. Oh goodness. All right. These are speakers. <laughs> Yeah. Which slide do you want? Which uh, slide? Down to back to here. All right. Um, so where was I? <laughs> um, so. Uh, uh, Implementing the, 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 oh, I can laser. There we go. Okay. There we go. All right. Um, so implementing, uh, maintaining session state is, is an important part of, of an application and being able to, to manage it is, is critical. Uh, to being able to track how the what the user is doing and to being able to pass information from one service to the next. Um, it's not a simple call and response process. Uh, you have a lot of complex interactions. And as the, the controller uh, graph on the left shows you, you, you have even hierarchies of, of information that you need to um, that you need to implement. Uh, the way, you know, in order to make that, that state work properly across multiple applications, and, and if you have a clustered server, you end up having to have very complex caching strategies. The, the Java application server that we use to maintain session state had this crazy, uh, messy cache um, uh, coherency protocol to maintain session state across all of the instances of the, the, the Java application. And if, if you, your, your uh, users would transfer from one to the next, you could get into these crazy locking scenarios where the, the data was not, was not up to date and, and it would, would cause all kinds of problems. So having to manage uh, a, a session state across instances is very complex and, and makes it a, a challenge to, to deal with. So, <clears throat> Our thinking is that, that you don't try and deal with session state and keep it in memory. Um, web scale applications, in order to scale horizontally, need to be ephemeral. They need to exist like a bubble and then disappear when they're not needed anymore. Um, the, uh, they need to be able to appear and disappear on demand and you can't keep state in those scenarios because if you do and your your user information is stored in uh, an instance that disappears then their their data is gone forever and that's that's a problem the way that <clears throat> that we have solved this is through attached resources um, and uh, you know if you compare and contrast the the, the way that session is is managed in a monolithic application the data is stored in memory uh, in your, your monolithic application, and every user can access their session information through that, that monolith. Um, in a microservice environment, 
you have multiple instances and the user is accessing those instances on a per request basis. You don't, they don't know which instance they're gonna access. So how do we keep safe? We put it into a readily available uh, cache of one sort or another. For us, um, we really like Redis. Uh, Redis is, is, is very fast. It, um, is, it has uh, atomic uh, transactionality, so the data store that you, you put in there is, is known to be good. It's, if it goes in, then it's, it's, it's available. And it allows your individual instances to quickly access the, the same information that they would be accessing in, uh, in memory in their session state. Any questions so far? Is this making sense? Okay, great. <clears throat> All right, so we've solved how to, app, uh, to, we've solved how to organize the application using MVC. Um, we've gotten around the session state problem, <coughs> but there are other issues that you have to deal with as well. And one of the biggest of them is, uh, is routing. <clears throat> Web applications, unlike many other types of, of applications, are actually multi-layered. Um, you typically have business logic in some sort of uh, dynamic page uh, system like PHP. You have display logic in your HTML and CSS, and you have uh, interactive logic in your JavaScript. Um, but the, the, the systems are not seamlessly uh, uh, separated, they are, are very much overlap and interact with each other. Um, and so, as you can see in the, the system, uh, the diagram on the left, um, there are many aspects to making the, the web application work effectively. And you have to have uh, a, a process for allowing your JavaScript application in particular to access the, the, the services in the back. And that's because JavaScript has some limitations. Um, one of the biggest is cross-site scripting requirements. Essentially, JavaScript applications can't just access an API randomly you know, at some other location uh, in, or, or some other URL. It has to route back to the origin server. So if you're at www.nginx.com, your JavaScript application has to go back to www.nginx.com to access services and functionality. Um, but if it does that, it needs to be able to access your services in the back end. And the best, and because you have a microservice application, you're gonna have multiple instances of your services that need to be load balanced. And if you have a lot of traffic coming through the system, you need to be able to load balance that, that data to the, back, to the back end. You also wanna implement things like rate limits. You wanna have uh, you know, security, you wanna have um, health checks, you wanna have all the, the features and functionality of a microservice and accessing another microservice that you would get in, in building out a normal microservice system. So for us, we found that, that Nginx Plus is a very good tool for doing this. Um, running your web front end on Nginx Plus gives you a lot of, of flexibility. In our uh, uh, reference architecture, we built our, our microservice web front end using uh, Nginx Plus with PHP and FPM. And we did load balancing to the back end services using Nginx Plus um, one of the things that, that you can do is have uh, a number of different types of, of load balancing schemes. For example, least time is one that, that, that I'm a big fan of. Um, essentially, it allows you to, to access services uh, and it will route to the service that is responding the fastest. And that is obviously a good way to manage your, your traffic to the back end. All right. What, what is Nginx Plus? Is it software load balance or what? So that's a, a, great, a great question. Um, 
Uh, Nginx Plus is a is the commercial version of our Nginx uh, web server load balancing reverse proxy uh, system. It is uh, commercial in that that it has a number of, of extended features on top of uh, our, our open source product. Um, in particular, it does things like like extended schema for load balancing. It has uh, health checks, active health checks, so that you can easily access your microservices and understand their health and be able to take them in and out of the, the load balancing uh, schema. Um, it also provides an API and, and dynamic resolution of, uh, of the upstream servers so that you can easily add new server, your new services in the back end and be able to take them up and down uh, seamlessly without, without uh, causing problems in the routing process. Finally, there's um, uh, a, a status API on the system, so you can get very clear and, and detailed metrics about the traffic that's going through the system. So that's Nginx Plus. Is there a, any technical reason why it doesn't really get into the market and say it would take Apache or Microsoft? Why is it always on a little bit of scale? It's not open source. So, um, <clears throat> our uh, obviously our open source product um, uh, Nginx is, is a very popular tool in in the world. In fact, uh, in last month, um, Nginx Plus uh, took over over fifty percent of the top ten thousand uh, websites as measured by traffic on the internet. So. You said Nginx Plus. Did I say Nginx Plus? I meant to say Nginx, um, uh, the open source product. So we in the company are too used to working with the Plus version. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and honestly, I we wish that it was the Nginx Plus pro uh, product. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it was it was actually our open source product, which we 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 love our open source product, and I've I've been using it for years, so it's a, a, a fine system. Um, so I was confusing the two though. They're 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 very similar, but the the uh, Nginx Plus product is is more for load balancing um, and and for high volume stuff. So is it competing with Apache Server or something more like an enterprise big IT type of load balancer? Um, <clears throat> so Nginx, the open source product, competes with with Apache. Uh, our Nginx Plus product. Uh, is definitely our customers are doing F5 replacement um, using Nginx Plus. But we're seeing uh, Nginx Plus also being used a lot in microservice applications because you can do service discovery very easily within a, a microservice environment. Um, some of the things that, that we're working on internally, uh, we are, are, are very excited about in terms of, of giving you, for example, a, um, a kind of, of SSL-based uh, communication fabric for all of your microservices that accelerates the process of, of communicating with your microservices over SSL. So there's, there's a number of, of ways that Nginx Plus Provides features and functionality beyond just F5 replacement. Can you talk a little bit more about your service discovery and a little bit Sure, sure. So um, one of the features of, of Nginx Plus is that it has a, a DNS resolver directive in it. It allows you to scan your your service registry using a DNS interface. So, for example, um, you know Mesos has a, a, a Zookeeper as its, as its service registry. If you put Mesos DNS in front of that, we can access uh, the Mesos DNS and scan the registry for any new instances of upstream servers that are, are listed in our, uh, in our configuration. Um, so you can have, if you have you know, a server instance uh, or a server, a named server in your configuration, it will get all of the instances of that and Put that into the load balancing scheme. 
the one of the nice features of it is that it has a, a frequency setting uh, so that you can scan the, the directory at a much higher frequency than the TTL. So um, you can you can check it every second, for example, to see if, if new uh, instances are, are up and running and utilize that essentially for service discovery across all of your microservices. We also have an API um, that you can you can add servers into the the uh, instances directly with the API. Um, Nick has a, a great demo that that dynamically puts in, uh, uh, services in and out of uh, the system like like every two seconds. Like it's oh, it's much faster than that. Way faster. I know. I'm, I'm, yeah, that's fun for the next. That leads to the next. Note. Yeah. We're we're big fans of putting nginx in front of the normal service discovery DNS endpoints because a lot of where we're seeing service discovery fall flat is you have a container from one microservice trying to access containers from another microservice and they hit a service discovery DNS endpoint and there's 10 addresses there and it picks one and now you have one usually container. the first exactly so you have one container over here talking to sending all of its traffic to one container in the other microservice. Not unless you are not your, the TTL. Yeah, and, and it can't do things like like health checking uh, the the service the services that it's uh, uh, load balancing against, and even if it does do health checking, it's usually at 200 requests as opposed to a a, a more granular type of health checking. So you know you could have a threshold on your service that said, "Don't send me traffic if I'm 80% of of memory usage," so that gives it a chance to recover and, and get back to a, a, a reasonable state, and then it'll start putting in uh, a traffic back to that system. So there's something like this, I guess, sounds like it has some features that are kind of like, 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 like and, That's know. exactly right, yes. Um, so we, using Nginx Plus, you can in, implement a circuit breaker pattern into the system without implementing history. The reason that stuff like history is <coughs> because if you just use normal Docker container linking or Zookeeper or console or any of those, it works, but it's pretty dumb. Like you get IP addresses and you hit them and you hope that the containers that they refer to are still up. And right. it's, you know, that's that. Is there a, I guess, a developer sort of arm sorry for this particular product? All right. Yeah, yes, there is. Talk about our, our fabric phone. Well, I, I did a little bit. So go, you go ahead. <laughs> so. Um, one, of, one of the approaches that we've taken is we've actually started to put the Nginx instances inside the Docker containers um, so that we can use them to route to the other microservices. So even if you're running locally, your the application running inside your container will proxy traffic through the local Nginx instance and you can update that quickly with the addresses and everything else. That's something that exists. That, is it? And just so you know, everybody here will have access to a developer license of Nginx Plus, so you can take it home and, and utilize it. Well, you'll have to download it. So, um, <laughs> but uh, it is it is one of those slides that we will show uh, at, at the end of our our presentation. Yes. So the part that hooked into the is that the uh, Nginx Plus module. So. Uh, it, it is it is the an, an nginx plus module. Um, it's the is it part of HTTP core for for nginx plus? Uh, love you, man. <laughs> <laughs> the, the DNS module is it is it a separate module for nginx plus? It's core functionality. It's core functionality. Uh, another thing to know about the nginx. Uh, uh, Wait, are we talking about the dynamic resolution of the object? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> we 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 are in that the DNS uh, utilizes the 
utilizes the dynamic resolution of the upstreams to store the, the resolved uh, instances. So, uh, okay, so like when I but if those attributes go away, um, does it re resolve that if the attribute comes to function? Yes. Okay. So, uh, so the the resolver has a, a frequency um, uh, it's a verify directive is okay. what it is and and you can set that to any time amount that you want um, for the the system that we're we built we've set it to one second so it scans DNS on on a per second basis so as soon as as IPs disappear they are out of the load balancing uh, scheme as well okay gotcha one thing that I wanted to mention, um, because this was this was an important question for me, and 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 fortunately, Vlad's team was was uh, gave me the, the answer that I was hoping for, and that was um, is the DNS resolution asynchronous and is it blocking? Um, and the answer is it's asynchronous and it's non-blocking. So you can have the the uh, resolver hitting DNS every second and it won't impact the, the performance of the, the rest of the system. It will simply add and subtract servers from the, the, uh, the um, shared memory space uh, as, as quickly as, as it can. So is there a way to, there a way to synchronize the frequency how often it works when you're checking up? It, okay, are these things so, so that that's a good that's a good question, and and we have two mechanisms for it. One is um, your your registry ha typically has some scheduler that manages the the uh, instances of your microservices in the back end, and will add and subtract them from the the system. You also have the ability to run the health checks from Nginx Plus, so it independently of the, the um, registry and the DNS that's, that's listed there, can be checking the, the services in the back end and, and take out uh, systems out of the load balancer if they're not available, if they're unhealthy, if you know, they're, for any number of reasons, they may, dis they may be taken out of the load balancing scheme separately from whether or not they're in the registry. And so you... <laughs> yes. So, um, so there, there's, there's a good amount of information. I'm actually working on a white paper to describe this, this full uh, uh, fabric model, as we call it. Um, uh, I'm hoping to get IBM to co-sponsor it with me, which would be, you know, a lot of fun. But uh, so we'll, we're, we're hoping for that. Um, expect to see some blog posts on it uh, later in April um, when our Nginx release nine is coming out. It will also have SRV records uh, in, in as a new feature for um, our DNS resolution. That will allow you to not only get the IP addresses, but the, uh, the service ports as well. So, um, you know, in a microservice environment, that's pretty critical because service ports are used ephemerally, so. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.